There we go. So first thing is prevention is best. So in diving, we always want to try and prevent the problem occurring before it actually happens to completely minimize the risk of any sort of issue or it can be caused. The diving does have a very good safety record. Um, if you are interested in this sort of stuff, BSAC do do a sort of year round um, sort of incident report system. So any incident what is reported to them, it's put into this sort of log which is released yearly uh, and you can see what sort of incidents have occurred, sort of the actions what have taken, the outcome, what's happened from this incident. So if you are interested, definitely go have a look. It can be available on the BSEC website. Um, so we achieve safety through a number of actions. So the first one is dive management and triangle of responsibility. So everyone who is diving or in that area of the diving has a responsibility. So whether you're part of the dive management, so uh, controlling who's going in and out of the water, controlling sort of the emergency situations uh, and the recovery of, of divers. Um, so that's sort of their responsibility. But even as an individual, so if when you go diving at Stony, you've got a responsibility of making sure that you're safe yourself and you're diving within your limits and what you're comfortable with to prevent yourself having a, an issue. Training practice and experience. So making sure your skills are up to date, uh, that ensures that you're, you're diving safely. Uh, and then you again, you don't dive beyond your capabilities. Uh, and if you are, then obviously we want to be with a trained instructor who's, you know, is taking you with you. So appropriate equipment, so making sure all of our equipment is functional and ready to dive with. Uh, and we do this by doing our buddy checks. So can anyone tell me what the uh, buddy check acronym is? Remember, hopefully you remember by now. Bar, yep, great. C do, do we know what it stands for? Quickly put it in the chat. Glad you know, James. Anyone tell me what it stands for? It's the air releases. There you go. Yeah, perfect. So yeah, we need to be doing our buddy checks before every dive. Make sure because this checks that we've assembled our gear correctly and that is working. You know, it's easy to forget to have done clips or turn your air on or uh, maybe you've not quite attached an inflator hose. You know, it's dead easy to, to do that. So our buddy checks just ensure that our kit is working um, completely functional. So throughout the dive, we also want to be monitoring our buddy. So this is just regular check-ins, you know, checking they're okay, uh, checking they're not like panicking or like, um, quite hesitant, uh, check-in for like gas consumption, make sure that you're keeping to your dive. Uh, common sense. So this links to fitness. So making sure you're not, you know, going around doing a crazy dive if you're not quite fit enough to do whatever dive you planned. It also links to overconfidence. So at the moment, you guys have just sort of started diving and you, uh, you've had a few lessons in the pool. So you're kind of getting the hang of it now, uh, hopefully. Uh, obviously, when you start picking it up, you might feel a bit overconfident, think that you can, it's dead easy and you can do it. And then you might start taking sort of extra risk, which you don't need to take. Uh, and then support from other divers. So it's really good to be diving with more experienced divers because you sort of get their experience, you get their tips, uh, and they can also play a large role in uh, a case of an emergency. The anticipation of problems. So first up is the entanglement risks of risks uh, of wrecks and piers. So if you're going to be diving around a wreck or around a pier, sort of like a fishing site, uh, more generally, you've got to be aware of maybe the abandonment of nets and lines. 
so this is an entanglement risk to a diver, obviously. If we're swimming across and get tangled up, um, we need to sort of anticipate this problem. And we do that by just being observant. It's a bit of a given, but as long as we're aware of our surroundings at all times, we can try and avoid them sort of nets and lines as much as we can. Obviously, we can't avoid everything, and that's why we try and carry a knife line, um, a knife, a line, or net cutter. So it is sort of important to know that getting the largest knife isn't necessarily the most efficient at uh, certain tasks. Uh, definitely getting a line cutter is much easier for cutting lines, uh, which is a bit of a given, given the name. Uh, and then keeping calm. So we want to avoid thrashing around and making it worse and just getting sort of more entangled. Uh, try not to twist or turn around if you are. Um, nine times out of ten, if you do get tangled, if you just back up a little bit from where you came from, uh, hopefully you do get untangled. But if not, just come uh, call your buddy over, get them to assist you. That's what they're there for. Um, they're there for safety and to enjoy your dive. So the next sort of problem to anticipate for is the separation underwater. So the way that we can do this is by using a torch. So if you're diving in a low light environment, so stony is quite low light, the visibility is not always great, uh, but having that torch, it just allows your buddy to sort of follow the beam of light. You know, if, they, if you do swim off a bit too far, chances are you still be able to see their torch beam. So it's just a little bit easier to follow. And obviously, if you're diving in really low vis, try and keep as close a contact as you can. You can also use buddy lines. They're not very widely used, but they're just sort of a line which, you know, you hold on to one end and your buddy holds on to the other to make sure you've got sort of a contact. And then surface separation. So if you're diving in the sea and it's really choppy, you can get sort of separated from your buddy, you get pushed away from each other. So the way that we sort of anticipate against this is uh, each diver try and carry a surface marker buoy or a DSMB, a, a delayed surface marker buoy. Uh, so what these are are just like big, long, inflatable tubes uh, make you stand out in the water. And you can use other emergency signaling devices. Uh, so these include uh, like diving flags, you can use strobes, um, like whistles uh, in the older sort of days uh, people used to carry around mirrors uh, and use the sunlight to sort of reflect the light so early resolution so as i've mentioned prevention is always better than cure but obviously we can't always prevent everything some stuff is still going to occur and if it does and we need to try and act as early as we can and regain control of this situation. So to resolve problems, obviously prevention and resolution, it's completely dependent on your rescue skills. So if you need to resolve the problem of maybe your buddy being out of gas, you need to make sure that you know the rescue skills for out of gas which is what we've started covering in the pool. So that's your uh, AS sense. When, when you do sort of encounter a problem, you know, don't press on. If it's uncomfortable, just cancel the dive. It, it's not worth uh, sort of putting, putting yourself through uh, the dive. And then seek buddy assistance. So most issues can be resolved sort of underwater. If you get tagged, if, um, I don't know, something's loose. Um, you know, your buddy can be there to assist you without it becoming a problem. And then buddy monitoring. So just continuous buddy monitoring throughout the dive can resolve problems. You know, if, if you see they're a bit hesitant for doing so, if you go in like off a ledge uh, and you can see that they're a bit visually hesitant, you know, don't go off the ledge. That's just going to cause more issues. They might start panicking, etc. And yeah, just practice, practice, practice. You guys have just started diving. So um, just keep on going and practice all your skills. And um, yeah. So diving problems. So we refer to an incident pit. 
your unresolved minor problems can escalate in seriousness. So if you don't act sort of quickly, like I've been saying, you know, these issues can be dragged down into worse and worse situations. So we could have sort of a normal activity, but a sort of a minor incident at the top there. And if you don't act on it, you know, you might just you might start having a bit more fear built up. And then suddenly this becomes an emergency situation when it really didn't need to. And then in the sort of the extreme situations, you know, start panicking, a much more serious sort of problem. And in the very, very extreme situations, you know, it can become fatal if, if we're not controlling these, uh, these issues under the water. So an example of this is a mass playing in water. So at the surface, you know, if, if you notice that your mask has like a little leak coming in, uh, you might just just get rid, ignore it. You know, it's just a little leak. If you then drop down to 15 meters and then suddenly it's really poor visibility, you can't really see anything and you've still got this leak coming in your mask, you might start being a bit anxious and start panicking underwater, which will then obviously it's now escalated the problem into a very serious, uh, very easy problem, what could have been solved at the surface. So just finding the leak or replacing the mask if it's damaged. And then early, early resolutions of problems underwater can prevent more serious consequences. So in diving, in your uh, training, we always train for the worst case scenarios. Um, so then hopefully, you know, less complicated and severe uh, problems do occur, you guys can take control of it really easily and with, with confidence. Yeah, it's important not to just press on. If there is a problem, stop. Regain your control. You don't want to start trying to swim up to the surface when you're all panicking because that's just going to throw off your buoyancy. So make sure you regain your control and then just abort the dive. The first sort of uh, sort of body problem you can get from diving is your decompression illness. So that's your DCI. We've sort of touched on this last lecture, and a lot of this is sort of a recap um, with a little bit more detail. But what decompression illness actually is, it was about the nitrogen release in your body, uh, and it occurs when your scents sort of aren't controlled and you've shot up to the surface. So you've not sort of allowed sufficient release of the nitrogen, what has been absorbed, uh, and you come straight to the top and then it causes these, these bubbles what form in your tissues and blood. It's important to note that ascents do not release all the nitrogen. So as we talked about last lecture with our surface uh, tissue codes, you know, we don't surface with the same tissue code as what we uh, enter the dive. You know, we, we still have a set amount of nitrogen absorbed in our body, which then gets released on the surface with our surface interval, uh, where most of the sort of release of nitrogen is uh, occurring. Further diving in this period adds to the nitrogen levels. So we talked about repeat dives. Um, so if you're doing multiple dives, then you'll be going further down the tissue code, get to sort of the EF range. And we always want to minimize our risk of DCI. Uh, this is using our tables and computers, which we taught how to use. Uh, hopefully you guys are, are comfortable doing that, you know, calculating your max depth and duration for your dives, depending on tissue codes. Uh, it's done by diving practice. So having spot on buoyancy uh, and avoiding them, them uh, sawtooth profiles, what we talked about. So um, lots of variation in your depth going up and down, up and down. And then also using nitrox. So when we when we replace that nitrogen content with increased oxygen, then we're going to be breathing in obviously less nitrogen, decreasing our risk of uh, of DCI. So DCI actually is a few issues combined under sort of one name. So the first sort of issue what it can cause is gas bubbles in uh, your body. So the causes of this as I mentioned, is inadequate elimination of nitrogen from tissues during your ascent. So you've gone up too quick um, from your dive, 
and you've not allowed the nitrogen to be released from your your cells. Uh, so you've got a too big a buildup. It can also be caused by lung damage, which we will get onto in the next slide. Uh, so I'll just sort of skip past that. So the effects. So bubbles can form in your tissues. Uh, it can distort and disrupt your tissues and uh, sort of force them out of shape. It can compress your nerve ends, uh, which can cause like quite quite significant pain. Um, it can also make make them tissues quite weak as well. It can also compress and damage your blood vessels. So if I just pull up a pointer here, so you can see here we've got some bubbles in the actual bloodstream. Um, but then we've also got a, quite a large bubble here, sort of on the outside of the vessel, which is compressing um, the vessel, which reduces sort of the, the flow uh, and increases your blood pressure. Um, so that will reduce the oxygen delivery downstream. Just turn off the pointer. There we go. Uh, yeah, so it will reduce your oxygen delivery downstream because not, not as much blood is going to be uh, sort of pumping through the body uh, with this restricted blood flow. Bubbles can form in or enter the blood. Uh, this is known as gas embolism. Uh, and bubbles can damage the blood vessels and surrounding tissues. We won't go too like scientific into this now. It is covered in the sports diver and the dive leader lecture. You will learn a bit more about that then. Um, but it's just important to know that they can sort of cause that damage at this stage. The next up is the lung damage. So the cause of lung damage is again you're, you've ascended too fast. You've held your breath on a, your on your ascent. Because as we know, rule number one of diving is we never hold our breath. If we we're, if we're holding our breath on ascent, then that that oxygen, that air in our lungs, is then going to expand and cause an overexpansion of our lungs. The effects of this is that you can experience a collapsed lung. So what happens here is that the gas in your air sacs of your lungs, they can actually escape and go into the thin membrane which surrounds your lungs. As you can see in the picture there, um, there's sort of a buildup of gas on the outside of the lung. And when you when you keep on sort of ascending, that air is going to expand and then sort of crush your lung, um, which is not ideal. We want to avoid that. Uh, you can also experience bubbles between the tissue. So similar to the collapsed lung, um, the air has sort of escaped from your lungs and then they started traveling between your tissues and your body. And you can get that gas embolism, which I've just mentioned, which is your bubbles in your bloodstream. So DCI onset. So signs and symptoms uh, can appear from seconds to many hours after resurfacing. So if when, after, after your dive, if you experience any sort of unusual symptoms, what you're not used to, uh, up to 24 hours after your dive, you do actually consider these as possible DCI symptoms. Denial is typically the very first indication of actually having DCI. So if, uh, if someone does uh, get DCI, chances are they will absolutely flat out deny that they've had it because um, they might usually they think that it's sort of embarrassing to have um, sort of got DCI from ascending too quick. Um, so they just flat, completely flat out deny it. Uh, and then, yeah, any unusual signs, they should be reported to the dive manager um, and then seek early advice. Um, from medical experts as soon as you can. DCI is a, a very serious problem. Um, you know, it, it can cause quite a lot of damage, but it's very, very treatable. As long as you sort of catch these symptoms early, get them treated, um, or more often than not, it won't cause any sort of damage. But it's just about not letting it go unchecked. So moving on to actually some of the signs and symptoms. So the signs of DCI, uh, itches and rashes. Um, so any sort of so these can 
be quite painful or not painful at all. Uh, nausea, headaches, confusion, weakness, paralysis. Uh, th these are uh, that is more uh, sort of a more obvious sign of of DCI. Um, you can actually experience a voice change. Uh, so what actually happens is your voice can start to crackle because um, some of the bubbles have sort of found its way around your voice box. Um, so then when you speak, it actually sort of makes this crackling noise. If if you push sort of like your neck as well, it sort of makes this like bubbling, uh, this bubble wrap sort of noise, the, the popping. Uh, this is really rare, um, but is a very obvious sort of sign that something's not quite right. You probably got DCI. Fortness of breath is another another sign and then unconsciousness, which is a very obvious sign uh, that something's wrong um, and obviously a really serious sign uh, and that medical attention needs like uh, immediate attention. So some of the symptoms. You could experience some chest discomfort. So this can vary in sort of pain level, but anything you experience needs to be taken deadly serious and reported to your dive leader, reported to your buddy, make sure people are aware. You also get aches in joints. So this can happen when sort of them nitrogen bubbles make their way into the joints, make it quite uncomfortable and make them make them ache. A numbness and tingling, um, usually in like hands and feet. You can also get visual disturbances uh, like dizziness. You can also experience uh, tunnel vision, loss of peripherals, uh, sort of double vision. Uh, you, can, you can also sort of see flashing lights sometimes. But pretty much any abnormality after diving, you know, like I said, if you experience anything what isn't usual, this is sort of a symptom that you should get, like, should check out um, in case you you do uh, you are suffering from decompression illness. So the treatment of DCI, there's only really one sort of treatment method, and this is recompression. So we do this by using uh, recompression chambers, uh, which basically they can just sort of artificially affect the atmosphere inside them to equate for sort of any depth so they can make like this tube uh, as you can see in the picture it's like a big metal tube so we can make it feel like it's 50 meters down uh, in that tube and allow you to ascend at the sort of official rate if you have gone up too quick so this can take hours to do depending on your seriousness of your your illness um, and on the like extremely serious cases, you might actually have to do repeats of uh, recompression chambers treatments. Yeah, this reduces your bubble size. Um, it puts you back down at depth and then brings you back up again, and allows that nitrogen to to release from your body. Uh, and then yeah, may may restore your compromised circulation. So reducing that bubble size, if you do have bubbles what are compressing your blood vessels, uh, it'll just help open them up and increase your circulation. And obviously, these things can't be operated by anyone. You need a, a specialist med medical supervision. There's just like only a handful of um, chambers uh, across the UK. Um, so if you are far away from it and you do get DCI, one sort of benefit is uh, you do you do end up getting a free helicopter ride to the nearest uh, recompression chamber. But obviously, don't go out and uh, try and try and get DCI for a free heli ride. Um, so yeah, diver first aid. So on the scene, if if you someone does have DCI, you suspect of uh, decompression illness, we give them one hundred percent oxygen. Because what this does is it improves the oxygen delivery to the tissues, uh, and then. It improves the nitrogen release. Um, so, because you're breathing in no nitrogen at all, um, you're not going to be absorbing anymore. So, it enhances sort of your release. But then also, if you've got a restricted blood flow, 
Um, so not as much oxygen is getting around to your essential uh, organs. If you're breathing 100%, whatever is getting around in your blood circulation is then a much higher concentration of, of oxygen. So it helps keep your essential organs sort of running and got enough oxygen. Uh, and then fluids. So if you do suffer from DCI, you can be given fluids uh, at a rate of one liter uh, per hour, if possible. Um, if you are dehydrated, it can actually hinder your flow of blood. We're giving drinks, water, don't give anything else, uh, avoid sort of fizzy drinks, and don't uh, give the casualty any sort of fluids if they have a risk of uh, falling unconscious. Um, or if they've got an injury, what will require surgery. So if they've got a really bad gash like on their leg, uh, you know, it's going to need, I don't know, stitches or something. I don't know, some sort of surgery. Uh, don't give them any liquid fluids because they will have to actually wait because you can't um, you have to have not drunk any liquids to uh, to go into surgery for a certain amount of hours. That's the end of the DCI. We'll quickly go through quiz one. Uh, there's only one question for this, uh, which is, so the dive manager informs you that the water is dark and the visibility is poor. What would you do? So if you guys want to have a little think and put your answer in the chat, I'll give you a minute or two. Take you through the answer. All right, let's see what we've got. So stay close to buddy, follow the torch. Yeah, bring a torch, stay close to your buddy. Yeah, great. So the one thing what sort of wasn't mentioned uh, is think about your dive of the day. You know, if it's really poor visibility, if it's really dark, are you actually going to enjoy it? Because if you're not going to enjoy it, there's no point doing it. And it's just taking unnecessary risk. Um, so yeah, if you don't want to dive in the dark, you don't want to dive poor visibility, you know, sometimes it's best just to call off the dive completely. And yeah, like you rightly said, bring a torch. It's really easy to follow the beam uh, and then keep very close to your buddy. Uh, OK, great. So that's the end of the first half. So I will now hand you over to uh, James, which is hope he's hopefully uh, still here. Yeah, I'm still here. Great. I'll just um. stop sharing. Then yeah, you can stop. I'll get on. Wait, that's on. What's going on here? That's the sports dive on. Yeah, you got the sports dive on. It works. <laughs> Not quite at that level yet. Oh, there you go. It's further down. There we go. Yeah, that's the one. Can we see that? Can you see that, Tom? Is that working? Uh, yeah, I can. It's full, uh, full screen, so. Oh. Uh, just did this last time. Let's try this again. And it's editing at the top.
There we go. This should work now, I think. Why is that not working? I hate how this sometimes doesn't do this. I can um, I can share and you can try and request access if you want, if you're struggling. There you go. Is that working? You will see. No, it's not letting me click on the things to share. Let me just. Okay, this is being weird. It's never done this before. Normally, just works straight away. <laughs> Jump to click through it for you. Yeah, you might need to. Um, why is that not? You can try and request access as well. Oh, rest cross control is probably why. I'll just click. Can you control it? No. Um, no. It's not clicking through. You just click through for me. Okay. So all that, guys. So we're looking at nitrogen narcosis. Um, so nitrogen narcosis is caused um, by breathing nitrogen under pressure. So basically the nitrogen is believed to kind of block the transmission of signals in the nerves, which happens when you're diving. Um, and it happens kind of as you get deeper. So yeah, as it's normally noticed once you get kind of below 30 meters. So it's not something you guys would probably experience um, as ocean divers. Only been, you're only being allowed to go to 20 meters, but it's always something to get uh, bear in mind because it affects people differently. Um, so the signs and symptoms are, it, it affects people in different ways. It's a bit like being drunk basically. Um, so, it's like a sense of either euphoria or anxiety. So depending on the person, some people might experience euphoria. Uh, some people might experience anxiety. Um, but yeah, you're unlikely to experience it as it's below only below 30 meters normally. Um, the best kind of treatment for it is just come up, just ascend. Um, you just go into a shallower depth, sort it out normally. Um, there's no no reason, nothing you need to do kind of uh, rescue yourself for example you just literally have to go deep uh, shallower not so deep so it's quite easy to fix um so we've talked about nitrogen now the other gas that we're mainly breathing is oxygen now obviously we think oxygen is it's kind of we need it to breathe and yeah we do um but when you have it in too high quantities it can become toxic um so it's yeah if you have too uh, if you have an excessive exposure to it, then it's quite toxic. Yeah, so risk increases with dive duration, depth, and the percentage of oxygen in your nitrox mix. So obviously we talked about nitrox and what that is the other week. Um, but as oxygen, as you have more oxygen in your uh, gas, because you're breathing nitrox, is therefore you've got more of it, so it's more likely to become, well, it's easier for it to become toxic. And as you're going for longer, you're going to be breathing more oxygen in, um, so it could be more toxic. And then if you're at depth, because of the increased pressure, um, you might be, say, at 10 metres, the air you're breathing at is at twice the um, pressure. So you're actually breathing in twice as much oxygen as you would be breathing at the surface. So you just have to bear that in mind um, that it can then become toxic. No. The signs and symptoms of oxtox um, are sight or hearing disturbances. So you kind of bit of tunnel vision maybe, or you, know, you start seeing spots. Um, muscle, muscular twitching. So if you, your leg or your arm starts kind of twitching, that could be a sign of oxtox, and you need to kind of work out, sort yourself out. Also, you need to sort yourself out. Convulsions is one of the more extreme symptoms, um, but it can happen. Um, and then the, the treatment for oxtox is you return to the surface, you abort the dive, um, and you get back to breathing normal normal levels of oxygen. Um, so it's a bit, whereas with nit nitrogen narcosis, if you, you can come up shallower and carry on your dive, with oxtox, you need to abort the dive, come, come to the surface, and 
have a get some medical attention, I think, when he gets to the surface. So the other thing that you could happen underwater is you could be have you could be breathing contaminated breathing gas. So this is either caused by poor maintenance of your cylinders or caused by the uh, operation poor operation of the compressor um, or poor maintenance of the compressor as well. So basically, if you're filling with uh, your you filling your cylinders, our compressor, for example, is run on petrol. So the results it could be contaminated with either the oil that's in the compressor um, because it's suddenly not working or the oil filter is not working um, and there's now there's now going to be oil in the uh, cinder or it could be carbon monoxide so there's exhaust fumes coming from the compressor so the uh, air that you're pulling into the cylinders you need to make sure that it's not bringing in that carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide from the exhaust fumes so that's why we do our, do our body check we do when we're doing the air we say it's breathing fine it tastes fine because you're looking out for if it's got any oil in it or that you can't really taste carbon monoxide or dioxide so it is that's mainly the oil um that you're checking for for the taste um i well else could it be contaminated with tom there you go water vapor the, um again it's that's not so much of a problem it's it can get into your lungs and form fluid in your lungs but also the water vapor might get in your cylinders and cause some cylinders to start rusting on the inside which then means you're going to be breathing in that rust which is not good at all so what you might notice pre-dive um an oily taste or smell to the air when you're breathing on your body check like i said um what you might notice on the dive is you might start feeling sick because the oil you're breathing in this oil and it's not good for you um or you might start feeling dizzy or disorientated or you might get a headache during the dive or even after the dive so it might not be immediate it might happen afterwards um that be normally from carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide um so the way you resolve it is you change your cylinder if you notice it before you go diving. So if you notice it in your body, check that it tastes funny. Then you swap your cylinder over, check do it again, check that cylinder, and hopefully that will be fine. If it happens when you're in during the dive, you abort it, so it comes to the surface, um, and so you can then start breathing normal air. Um, or if you need, if it's really bad, you might want to have an AS ascent. So you guys have done that in the pool. Um, so you've been breathing off, you breathe off your buddy's uh, cinder, um, so you're not going to be breathing your contaminated gas. And then if you, what you should really do is avoid the diving again on the same day, because you don't know how much you take it in. For example, you might not notice, say, for 10 minutes until, until 10 minutes into the dive. At that point, you might have breathed in a lot of this contaminated gas. So it might not impact you immediately, but you could become ill later on in the day so you don't want to dive again during the day if possible and you might need to consider medical attention um, especially when you've got like carbon monoxide or something you, um, you're probably all aware of carbon monoxide poisoning um you probably learned that in like, gcse biology maybe um so yeah, that's just something you need to watch out for and get medical attention so if it happens you need to report it to your dive manager you need to report it to a filling station. So if you've got it filled from a filling centre, um, then you tell, it, tell them. If it happens at the club, uh, it will be the kit officer's fault. So that's either Mike or me. So if you've got a dodgy fill, you know who to blame. Um, you know, it's probably me. Uh, but you'll probably be fine if I'm doing it. Um, but yeah, you need to tell us that that's happened so we can make sure it doesn't happen again. So if you have a gas supply failure, um, the causes of it are poor monitoring of gas. So you might not be checking how much air you've got when you're diving. So suddenly you're out of air, um, which is quite a poor thing to do. Don't, don't do that. Keep Make sure you keep checking on your air. Um, if you're diving in cold water, which you will be, um, there's a chance of something called a free flow. So it's when the regular either out of the regulator, there's um, loads of air starts coming out. Um, not when you're just breathing in. It's just a constant stream. 
Um, so that can cause you to run out of uh, air or because it's coming out a lot quicker than it should be. So it runs out very quickly. Um, another cause is uh, equipment failure. So for some reason something breaks um, and suddenly you can't breathe from your second state, your regulator, or you can't um, get air out of the cylinder, for example, because the first stage breaks, then that is something that could happen, but it's rare. We prevent it, um, keep checking your gas, how much you've got, constantly checking it, uh, protect the equipment from the cold before diving, so don't leave. Uh, you'll try, well, try not to leave equipment in the car overnight if it's going to be cold. Um, it doesn't make a huge difference, um, but it's definitely something to be careful if it's going to be really cold the night before. Um, keep servicing it, so that's not necessarily what you'll have to be doing at the moment, but once you start getting your own equipment um, and stuff in the future, you want to make sure it's serviced, but we as a club make sure all the club kit is serviced for you. Um, so if something like that happens, you need to rescue or either yourself or your buddy will normally help you rescue. Um, so you're all in the pool, you will have done your AS ascent practice. So it's what you do if you're running out of air or running out of gas. Um, so it's the AS is a backup system for if something happens to your own uh, air supply. You abort the dive if it happens, you don't kind of start breathing off your buddy's air and carry on swimming around for a bit. Um, you come straight to the service and you abort the dive. You know, send with your buddy. Um, you don't uh, like you don't go to the surface and then your buddy ditches you and goes back down on his own. Um, you send with an AS supply. And then once on the surface, uh, you want to make sure the rescue you want to fully inflate your own BC. Um, so you'll learn what to do. I might be in the next one of the next pool sessions, but it's you can already inflate your BC um, so that you can still float on the surface. Um, and or if it is a really bad scenario, you might just want to drop the weights. So some of you may have been using weights in the pool, but I think a lot of you were. Um, you're needing more weights when you go into open water. So by dropping those um, when you're on the surface, it's almost impossible to then sink. Um, so it's quite a good way to stay on the surface if it is an emergency. But you don't want to lose your weights. They're kind of important if you need them for the future. So another type of kind of another type of rescue is called a controlled buoyant lift or a CBL. Um, so it's when you have uh, an incapacitated or unconscious uh, buddy, which is rare, but it might come from someone's breathing the wrong gas, for example. They might be passed out because they've been breathing a dodgy gas. Um, you abort the dive is what you need to do, and you need to get that buddy to the surface. Um, so that is your main priority: is get them to the surface. It's you may need to come up quicker than you normally would, so the normal ascent rate might not be kept in mind. You might come up a bit quicker. And then you need to make sure the casualty is buoyant on the surface. They're not going to be conscious to fill up their own BC or make sure that they're in a good state. You need to be doing that for them. Um, and then once you get to the surface, you need to signal for help. Um, get more, get If you're at Stony, for example, and you start uh, shouting for help, um, they will send a boat out to you. It'll come straight out there um, and they'll be on you within a minute so that you won't be there on your own uh, and you've got people there to help. Um, and you might need to consider alternative means of positive buoyancy. So if there's a failure in uh, their air supply, for example, and they don't have any air for their buoyancy, um, for their BC, you might need to consider work out another way to do it. So you might need to inflate it by already by yourself. So you might need to breathe into it if they are their cinders out of gas. If they're convulsing, which normally is a sign they're, they're suffering from oxtox or oxygen toxicity, um, you need, ideally you want to wait until the convulsions stop before lifting because you might be lifting them up and then suddenly they might have a convulsion and they might rip, uh, them, like rip themselves away from you or break some gear, some kit, which isn't good. Um, so you want to make sure if you can that they're not convulsing before you start lifting them. So there's another type of rescue is a free ascent. It is ideally a very last resort, um, you know, see it or you don't really do it very often. Um, it may just require straight upward fitting. Um, so rather than using your buoyancy A, do a buoyancy VCD, um, you just want to fin straight up to get to the surface. Or you might just want to drop your weights um, and then that launches um, casualty to the surface because they're now, uh, they're not, 
heavy enough to sink, so they will want, their body wants to float, so they go up to the surface. They have positive buoyancy. And then you will always want to exhale continuously when you're going up because, as we said, never hold your breath when you're diving. Your lungs might all expand and might rupture. So we'll make sure you're continuously exhaling on the ascent, on a free ascent. And then once you've got to the surface, however way it's happened, out of these three or four methods, um, you want to basically, the surface cover or the dive manager is on the surface and they will be monitoring both the casualty and the rescuer. So the casualty might be the person that seems to be at risk right there. Um, but the rescuer, for example, may, may might have brought the casualty to the surface really quickly and they might then suddenly start uh, experiencing DCI. So you need to make sure you're monitoring both the casualty and the rescuer or they might have shock because the adrenaline has been kicking in while they've been rescuing and suddenly they're now, the adrenaline has kind of stopped and they're in shock. So you need to keep an eye on them as well. You need to administer oxygen first aid um, and that's kind of the best way to solve it. Um, it gets oxygen into their system and it can help. Um, you need to seek specialist medical advice, so either by the Coast Guard normally if you're out at sea or if you're um, on a shore dive, for example. Uh, however, you might also want to phone the Hyperbaric Association. So they're the guys that basically run um, the chambers in the country and the chambers is what you need to get to if you're um, if you're requiring urgent recomp recompression. So you need to get to uh, one of the chambers and that phone line, um, the Hyperbaric Association, is all, they're always there, it's 24 seven. So you can get specialist medical advice if you need to. If you're out at sea, then it might be best to get it from the Coast Guard because they'll know what they're doing as well. Um, and if you they need urgent recompression uh, and you're out at sea, even if you're not, you might be on surf on the land, but you might be miles away from uh, a recompression chamber. You might need to get the coast guard out or some of the helicopter, and then you get helicoptered to a, a hospital where the chamber is for a free helicopter ride. It could be quite good fun, um, but you don't really want it to happen. But if it's if we are, you'll be needing recompression urgently, so you need to get there quick. So that should be most of it. Uh, we went through it quite quickly, but we'll do a quiz now. Um, can any of you remember what signs and symptoms are of a decompression illness or a DCI? Type it in the chat to you. Two, if anyone's typing. Yes, yeah, so you got um, some Dan, you've got rashes, yep, um, nausea, yep, uh, headaches, confusion, shortness of breath, those are all good symptoms or signs. Um, you need to keep an eye on for those. Voice might be crackly, yep, that's another symptom. Um, so, Tom, do you want to show it says? So, signs, denial is another one. Um, so they might be saying that, no, I'm fine, I'm, I don't need any help uh, when they do need help. So, yeah, voice crackling, voice becomes starts changing, shortness of breath, itches or rashes, nausea, headaches, confusion, weakness, unconsciousness, they might become unconscious. So, symptoms, uh, chest discomfort, aches and joints from the bubbles, numbness and tingling, visual disturbances or dizziness or any other abnormality after a dive. Um, now these aren't necessarily going to be immediate so make sure that you kind of keep an eye out so it might have happened. Uh, you want to make sure you're aware that these symptoms could develop later on in the day, like a few hours after a dive or a few hours after you surface. So don't just think you're fine if you haven't got any symptoms when you come to the surface straight away. Um, after a rapid ascent when you think you might have experienced a DCI. 
you want to make sure that you're kind of keeping attention, keeping an eye on yourself for the next day or next few hours. Um, so yeah, it's not necessarily immediate. So a quick summary. Um, we are now starting to begin, beginning to understand the causes and effects of potential problems when you're diving. So your DCIs, decompression illness, your nitrogen narcosis, you might hear, hear people call that being knocked, um, but a sense of euphoria, um, being, feel like you might be drunk. So a lot of people might come to the surface when they've been knocked and might not necessarily remember the dive. Um, so they might be uh, like laughing a lot when they're underwater or not kind of doing what you would expect them to do if they if you dive them a lot so then you can go you know there it might be knocked so contaminated breathing gas you know why it might happen you know how to spot it and um, what to do if it happens you run out of gas or you have a gas supply failure if you experience oxygen toxicity you know what to, and now you know you're beginning to know what to do to resolve these problems so Oxygen administration, uh, getting into a chamber for recompression treatment, and you're starting to know how to rescue um, yourself or your buddy from the dive to get into the surface. Um, I think that's everything. Yeah. Um, so I hope you guys got that. Um, there's no questions. If there are any questions, just put them in a the chat or ask away. Um, if not, we'll see you guys in just over an hour and a half for the social. I should see many of your faces there. Um, and there is the Just Giving page for the social tonight. <laughs> Barney's just put in the chat. He wants your money. Need your shameless plug. Yeah, we need, <laughs> need that entrance fee. Um, we believe we can see who's put the money in, so we'll know uh, if you're just turning up. Blackmail. Yeah, basically. Um, but yeah, uh, I'll see you guys later. I've got a question. Oh, yes. If you develop symptoms, um, you will need to get treatment. Um, so either by contacting the hyperbaric chamber or the Coast Guard or someone that would know um, what to do. Um, you would need to also report it to your dive manager because if your buddy that you've been with um, isn't showing any symptoms, but they've done the same ascent profile that you've done. They very are very likely to also be bent or to be experiencing a DCI. So you need to report to your dive manager so that they can make sure that uh, your buddy is get fine and um, doesn't and gets a treatment if they need it. Does that answer your question? Right. Was there anything else? No, it doesn't seem like it is. There is. Cool. So thanks for coming, guys. Um, we'll be doing one of these again next week. Uh, and fingers crossed, we're going to be back maybe in the pool in a couple of weeks if lockdown ends on the second. But I doubt that. Um, <laughs> but we'll see what happens. When we, hopefully, we can get you guys back in the pool and get the training underway again. Um, but no, thank you for coming. And we'll see you later. Cheers, guys. We'll see you at the social.